Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name's Brian, and with the Greyjoys getting ready to crash upon U.S. shores, I figured it would be a good time to start talking about some more of their commanders. Uh, specifically, I wanted to go into Victorian Greyjoy, the Iron Captain. So to get a better feel for what Victorian is bringing to a Greyjoy army, let's take a look at his commander-specific tactics cards. The first one we come up across is Rush of Aggression. So this triggers when a friendly unit performs a charge action before rolling the charge distance dice. That unit automatically counts as rolling a 6 on all of their charge distance dice, and their melee attacks gain critical blow. Uh, after this attack's been completed, unless the attacker is Victarian's unit, they also become vulnerable. So already we're kind of setting the stage to show that there's, there's two things going on with Victarian. He's kind of a showboat commander, like Tormund, where he wants to be the, the center of attention, and he's also very fighty. So being able to just, like, dash the sixes on your uh, charge, like just almost guaranteeing a charge, kind of, uh, depending on where you're positioned, right? You know, you're not going to fail if you're going for a long bomb or anything like that. On top of it, you're, ending, you're getting a critical blow on top of that one, so you're getting the chance to re-roll any dice that don't hit, if you're hitting well enough. Like, if you're hitting on twos or threes, I might just fish for the extra sixes, depending on how many I miss. Um, I, especially on twos, right? You just want to go for those, and if you miss any, well, whatever, you're, you're just you that's your price you, that's the price you pay for being greedy but the other part of this card is that uh we you know we want to be playing this on victarian's unit um unless we're not too worried about getting becoming vulnerable you know if you're kind of in a point where you have a unit that can kind of collapse aside uh this could be the kind of card you would put on them to where you don't really care if that unit becomes vulnerable because they're likely going to smash through whatever target they're going for and then you don't have to worry too much about somebody trying to or your your opponent trying to capitalize on that vulnerable token the next card we come up across is Assault Orders. This triggers when a friendly NCU claims a zone. You can replace that zone's effect with one friendly combat unit performs one melee attack action, or uh, if this targets Victorian Greyjoy's unit, it may perform one charge action instead. So this is a pretty cool card. Um, typically when I am looking at tactics decks, I don't really like cards that say you have to exchange abilities on a... Uh, on the tactic zone when an NCU claims it to get an effect because essentially you're giving up two things kind of. You're giving up your activation for an NCU uh, which could be giving up the uh, well of course you're giving up the ability on the zone and uh, depending on which one you're activating you might be losing out on that person that NCU's ability too but um, you're also losing a tactics card so it's kind of like a it, it's a rough trade for some of these uh, exchange abilities but for this particular card I really do enjoy it because the Greyjoys don't really have a whole lot of synergy with things on the tactics board. Like, they can kind of exist outside of them. And sometimes the things that they want to take, they don't really necessarily need. So, being able to make use of, like, zapping a panic, z the, the crown zone or something. You know, you're not going to use that as Greyjoys. But if it happens to be open, opened up and your opponents could utilize it to hurt you, you could take this. You could take that zone and still turn it into something good. Uh, in the 1.7 or 2021 update... There's a emphasis from the developers that uh, extra activations are going to be kind of uh, rare. And this isn't necessarily an extra activation. It's just kind of capitalizing on, it, on another one. So you turn, take a, a poopy activation and turn it into something cool. Again, we kind of get this showboaty commander idea where we can just make a melee attack if it's anyone we target. But if it's Victorian's unit, we can get that charge instead. So there's a lot of cool things that we can... Uh, kind of facilitate, especially when you're looking at like Rush of Aggression and uh, Assault Orders together. Not that I would want to play Assault Orders into a Rush of Aggression, more so that I could try and clear a unit with Rush of Aggression, and then after that get Victorian to just kind of bulldoze through to another unit, depending on how much we've sandpapered that other one off. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to really push the advantage with this particular commander and these two cards alone. The final tactics card that we have for him is Sustained Assault. Now, this triggers when a friendly unit is performing a melee attack before rolling the attack dice. If this unit began the turn engaged with the defender, uh, it rolls its highest attack die value. If this targets Victorian Greyjoy's unit, it may also re-roll any attack dice. So, uh, 
more combat focused and again we get that showboaty sense where we want to be putting these on Victarion's unit because he gets a ton of cool uh, bonuses out of it but the Greyjoys when I kind of look at how their tactics deck is set up and how their units function and this pillage mechanic they they have some trickiness to them but they really have this uh, attrition based feel and I know that like everything has the attrition based feel unless you're like a Lannister or something but um being able to utilize or take wounds on your own units to try and forward a, a grander attack plan. You know, like, you're going to be taking a lot of hits because Greyjoys aren't, like, super-duper durable. But um, you also want to be kind of holding out for the long game. And the sustained assault kind of makes that happen. Uh, it also is kind of like a, a fake countercharge card where if someone decides to try and come into you to try and hold up a unit from getting those extra rerolls or making it so the the, the charge isn't so impactful. Uh, this can kind of mess with that a little bit. First of all, if you've lost any ranks, you're going to be getting high, the highest attack value out of your dice. And uh, you're also, if you happen to be Victorian, you get those rerolls anyways. So I think the, the gist, when we look at all three of his tactics cards together... Victorian really likes the, the ABC logic. He likes to always be charging. And uh, really pushing that kind of combat uh, pressure on the table. And his cards definitely allow him to do that, him specifically even. So um, you might, when you first look at this, feel like uh, one of the things that probably holds him back is that you're probably going to be wanting to play these a lot on his unit and not really giving a whole lot of attention to the other ones. But we've got some other tricks that can kind of, you know, roll into that to, to make it a little bit more interesting for us. When we look at the rest of the Greyjoy Tactics deck, there's quite a bit of synergy in here too. Like, We Do Not Sew is just another way to get some more combat actions out there and take advantage of fighting a bunch. Um, even what, what is Dead May Never Die is a really great one because if you combine that with uh, Sustained Assault, then that just means that your opponent goes in, tries to wipe a unit. You say, "Nope, I'm not gonna stop. You're, you're not gonna stop me from keeping this unit around." And then you start the turn engaged anyways, so you can play sustained assault and make sure you get a bunch of value out of that. And then if you happen to destroy any, you can try and get some wounds back through other ways. There's just a the, the tactics deck for the Greyjoys ends up playing really well into what uh, Victorian wants to do. He's he doesn't quite have the the tricksy support that some of the other commanders do, but I think there's tons of synergy within here even something like blessed with steel and stone can do quite a bit for a victorian list so i think that he fits really well with the gray joys in terms of their like overall play style and the goals they want to achieve especially when you look at pillage tokens i think that victorian is going to be the kind of person or the kind of commander that can just like really help his army stack those things up and start utilizing them right away so one of my favorite things about the idea of the 1.7 update is that I never have to say that this particular commander is an on-the-table commander because we're, first of all, we're done with NCU commanders as soon as 1.7 hits, and now I don't have to worry about any legal action coming from Chase from on-the-table gaming for saying his catchphrase. So Victorian Greyjoy, as the attachment, has some pretty sweet abilities too. If we didn't already have enough coming from his tactics cards for pushing that aggressive advantage, plus some of the Greyjoy cards. We also get Overrun as an order, so when this unit surges forth, instead of surging forth, they can just perform a charge action. So when we combine that with some of the other cards here, we can make sure that Victorian's unit's going to cleave through something that he's going into, and then just gets to set up for another charge after that. He also happens to have the Furious Charge ability, so he really is just kind of like a stamp of, you know, what Tormund is currently in 1.6 but might not be in 1.7 i can't remember if they revealed Tormund's new stuff or not but anyways this isn't a Tormund video even though basically it's Tormund with a helmet on but uh the furious charge thing just says if he charges something they become vulnerable so you're you have like a lot of ways to get some cool uh advantage out of that between you know the assault orders and then overrunning and doing all that other fun stuff you can just stack a bunch of cards on this unit to make them a complete nightmare for your opponent to deal with so when it comes to figuring out what kind of unit I want to put him on. There's a lot of really good options in Greyjoys for him, but for me, I'm going with maybe a little bit more, I wouldn't call them a glass cannon so much, but they are definitely more about 
fighting and not survive. Well, they're kind of surviving. That's the weird thing about Greyjoys is there really is no such thing as about there really is no such thing as being too much about one thing or too much about another. You just do the same things in a different way. They all fight. They all sustain, just not all in the same fashion. So instead of rambling on about that, I'm going to go ahead and just say we're dropping him into a unit of House Harlaw Reapers. So this unit isn't particularly fast, but not slow. They have that uh, movement five. The Their attack stat on their Reaper fervor, Reaper's fervor geez that i don't like saying those two words together um but it has a, a three plus to hit which is pretty good especially since that seems to be i don't know if it's so much more rare in 1.7 because we haven't seen everything shake out yet but at least you know the developers have told us those things are kind of shaping out to where three plus is going to be kind of rare um but they have a 754 attack stat which seems like a really sharp drop off but it's still high enough to be able to do some work they have a five plus defense save with a six plus morale so they don't have the thickest armor in the universe but their morale is decent enough to where they should be able to stick around quite a bit and we have some ways to mitigate the the bad armor save when we look at their reaper's fervor weapon uh they have the vicious ability which is really nice to try and help push some extra wounds you know uh we want to be attacking often, and sometimes the panic test is enough when you have a unit that can hit this much, this well, and with things like uh, the vulnerable token from Victarion, and then all the other cards we're going to be using to where it might get us closer to triggering off that, uh, that overrun ability. The other thing about them is that when the enemy fails a panic test from this attack, for each pillage token on the unit, we can choose one of these abilities, and or we can choose one of these things, but multiple times for the same effect. So um, they either suffer one wound or we restore one wound. Now, I haven't read through the 1.7 rules enough or like really memorized timing to be able to tell you that if you, you know, you have a unit, you charge them, they fail their panic test, and you've got one body left in there and you have a pillage token on you, if you use the pillage token for the Reaper's Fervor to, or you don't have to use the pillage token, you just use the ability from it to make them suffer one wound, I'm not 100% sure if that's going to trigger a sudden charge for you, but I'm sure someone in the comments section can inform all of us. I'm just not 100% sure on that one. But at any rate, it's still a way to make sure that you're crashing through other wounds, making it harder for your opponent to deal with you. And if you happen to have taken a couple wounds here and there, you can always try and restore some and go on the healing track of things instead of trying to go on the more um, active attrition thing side of things. The other deal, of course, is pillage. They can hold up to pill two pillage tokens, and every time they kill an enemy rank off, which should be really, really easy and super frequent, um, they'll be able to stack up a pillage token. So you shouldn't have a hard time with Victarion on this unit to start getting those pillage tokens quickly. And I think that uh, for the for the whopping six points that they are, uh, I think that they're a really good unit to be putting him on. Now, that's not to say there aren't other good options for him, but for me, I really like the aggressive and variable attrition set that comes with the House Harlaw Reapers. There's a lot of options within this unit. They can kind of really adapt to the way the game's going for them, and that is good for Victarion because it means if your opponent has an answer in one way or another, you can kind of mitigate that by either doing more damage to a unit that can do a lot of work to you, or putting extra wounds on yourself when you're going into a unit that's a little bit harder to shift where you'll be kind of chewing on them for a while. They kind of just are the, the Swiss Army knife of Greyjoy, in my opinion. So the next unit that I'm going to plop into the list is a unit of Greyjoy Ironmakers. And I think a lot of people might want to put a uh, Victarion in this unit. And it's not that they're wrong. It's just... A different option, right? I don't think that there's, you know, a benefit for one versus the other. It depends on how you want to play, what your personal flavor is. I appreciate the variability of the Harlaw Reapers, and uh, I can definitely see where some people would appreciate the survivability of the Iron Makers. So before I get too far into the debate on whether they should go into which unit, um, the Iron Makers themselves, they, they're speed five, so they're, they're not, you know, super fast, not super slow. They have the same exact attack stat as the House Harlaw Reapers with a three plus to hit and then a seven, five, four decay for their attack stat. Um, they have a 4-up defense save and 7-plus morale, so they, they're a little bit worse on the morale side, a little bit better on the armor side. But then they bring that great Baratheon hammer, 
and that gives them critical blow, and if the defender ends up rolling a 1 on any of their defense dice after the attack's completed, they become weakened. So this is another reason why I don't want Victorian in this unit, because I'm kind of losing out on the benefit of a, a rush of aggression where I don't get the extra critical blow out of that. And not that that's a huge, huge deal. It's just when I end up having rules that kind of overlap on one another, I feel like I'm kind of uh, doing myself a disservice where I could be increasing the output of a unit by giving them an ability that they don't have instead of using something like Rush of Aggression on this unit to give them an ability that they already have. It's just one of those like economics of activations and tactics usage that I kind of really... Uh, bring to my play with this game. So for their pillage ability, they are just like everyone else. They hold two pillage tokens, get an extra one whenever they nerf a rank. But then their rated armaments is how they take advantage of those pillage tokens. And this one just says for each pillage token on the unit, they get plus one to their defense dice rolls. So they can go up to a two plus armor save, which makes them extremely survivable. But outside critical blow and the weakened business, this is kind of the unit that I would want to use to maybe get some early wax in on something and then just kind of hold the middle line with a unit that's your kind kind of tussling back and forth with your opponent. They're really hard to shift, and the Greyjoy cards and other abilities and NCUs can make sure that these guys stick it out in the long run. So when I'm thinking about where I want to put Victarion, the reason why I don't get him in this unit is because I feel like the role for these guys is to kind of hold the middle and be an unshiftable brick. And Victarion himself wants to very much shift and get around the table and start charging into other things. So the Iron Makers... While they can do that and not have too many problems with it, I just kind of feel like their role's a little bit different for me. I am bringing Newt the Barber in this list, who I think kind of looks like Yarp, or whatever the guy's name was from whatever movie that was. Why can't I think of the name of it? Anyways, this isn't a movie YouTube channel. It's a, a Song of Ice and Fire YouTube channel. Um, so Newt the Barber is a, a one-point attachment that you can only bring with Victarion. And, uh, well, I don't know if you can only bring him with him. I can't see the reminder text on the back of the card. But um, it's probably it's you probably only want to bring him with Victarion. So first off, he gives the Furious Charge ability. So when, you're, when you charge something, they become vulnerable, which works really well for the Iron Makers because outside Critical Blow, they don't really have anything to kind of push that damage more, for, more, for, or more forward. So just making sure something's vulnerable when they connect is really, you know, it's beneficial. He has the Victarian's Vassal ability, so this model counts as Victarian Greyjoy when tactics cards are being played on the unit. Now, I know I kind of said that Vic the I didn't want to be doing things like Rush of Aggression on them because I'll be getting that critical blow business, but sometimes getting them to just auto-succeed a charge, or not auto-succeed a charge, but make sure they roll their sixes is valuable, even though I'll probably be doing that somewhere else. But things like Assault Orders, just to make sure that they can get some extra charges if they need it, like, y there's nothing wrong with having something on here that makes sure that, you know, if I want to try and get more use out of some of these cards, that um, this unit can kind of, you know, at least take advantage of that. They also have the Motivated by Coin ability. So when a friendly NCU claims the coin zone, you can replace that zone's effect with Newt's unit performs one attack action. So this is the other reason why I have him here, is because the Iron Makers, I want to kind of play them as that tar pit type unit since they have all these... It's, since they have the raiding armaments ability to kind of increase their survivability. So it means that typically they're going to be stuck in combat. So when my opponent wants to do something like heal, he's going to have to think twice about it because first of all, I stop him from doing it. And second of all, if they ever do it, if they ever take it, like they just don't have, like if they need it for something, um, say you're playing against a Lannister or a neutral player and they just want that zone, they're going to have to pay for it because this unit will likely be tied up with something. So I think Newt is a has a good home with the Iron Makers, even if it might seem kind of a little bit backwards compared to what I've been saying lately, or at least earlier with the House Harlaw Reapers. But again, you can kind of shift around this unit a little bit. It's just this is kind of how I want to play them because the list as we move along doesn't really have a whole lot of great ways to hold the center and... The, or, or hold a very a particular point of interest, right? Because the game isn't played just around the center. So that's what I like here, and I'm sticking to it. So the next unit I'm bringing along in this list is the Ironborn Trappers. Uh, they're speed five. They've hit on fours with their 
barbed pikes. They're, they have a 6-6-3 six, six, attack stat, so it's pretty sustainable, just not super amazing. 6-up uh, armor save and an 8-up morale, so that's really, really not good. Um, but we'll get kind of into what their role is in a little bit here. So they have the Order Trapper's tools. You can target one enemy engaged with this unit, and then for each pillage token on the unit, they become vulnerable or weaken. And, of course, they have the pillage mechanic where they get two if they you know, have wiped out enemy ranks. But then the big one, they, the big ability that they have on them that I appreciate a lot is Disrupt. So enemies engaged with this unit suffer neg one to hit. So the Ironborn Trappers, first of all, they're super duper cheap at four points. So they kind of just get me an extra body. Um, they're definitely one of those uh, units that you kind of have to read the table to see what their role is going to be at the beginning of each game. So I kind of have three different roles slated for them, and two of them are kind of the same. So the first one is if there's an objective in the back of my table that I need to hold with something that's derpy, it's these guys that are going to be doing it. Now my opponent can try and zap them with the crown to try and get some extra wounds off them, but since panic chests aren't as... Uh, damaging with this new addition, or not new addition, but the new update, uh, I feel like it's not a real good use of their time, so if they want to just keep sacking an NCU's activation to zip these guys in the forehead, then I'm not too worried about it. The other role, which I kind of say is two roles, is kind of going buddy cop with either Victarian's unit or Newt's unit. So if there's a unit that Newt wants to go into that is a little bit more punchy that can try and get through those Ironborn Reavers a little early, I want to make sure that they're also engaged with these guys because then they have to either focus their attacks on this unit, letting the Iron Makers do what they want to, or they have to go into the Iron Makers still at neg one to hit. Either way, they, whoever they hit is neg one to hit. And that's going to be just difficult for them to deal with. If they have units that are a little bit more targeted to kind of punching through something like uh, Victarian's unit, then these guys are going to go pair off with them, and they're just going to kind of walk up the table and make sure that uh, whatever gets into Victarian is at least going to be neg one to hit, or maybe they have to go into this unit first, and then Victarian's just kind of, he's like kind of running body blocker for him, you know? And uh, that's kind of what I feel like their role is, or their three different roles is. And you just kind of have to figure out what it is your opponent's going to be playing and uh, and what they need to be doing at that time. So it's a lot of just assessment to figure out where they need to go, just like you would with any other unit, but these ones just have kind of a more specifically pointed role between these three different modes. Another unit I'm bringing to this list is Ironborn Bowmen. So these are another cheap four-point unit that comes in at speed five. For their long-ranged weapons, they hit on fours and have a 664 stat for that. Their short swords, they hit on fours as well, and then go 543. So this isn't typically a unit you want to be charging things into. They have a 5 plus defense save and then 8 up morale, so they're not really putting up a whole lot of numbers either. They're kind of in that same boat as the uh, trappers are. But for their ironborn arrows, they can reroll attack dice if they're targeting an enemy in the flank or the rear. So if you're going for those areas, you'll you'll end up getting the reroll bonus and then like the kind of pseudo sundering going on. So they can be quite dangerous. The big thing for them is the divide the spoils ability, where after completing an attack for each enemy rank that was destroyed, one friendly unit with a pillage token in long range or with the pillage mechanic within long range of the enemy that you're shooting down gains one pillage token. So they end up just getting to like deliver, you know, pillage tokens to whom whomever happens to be around them. So Right off the bat, I'm going to say that I don't have the uh, attach the attachment, um, the Reaver Captain, I believe it is, that lets them outflank. And uh, it's mostly because of points. You could probably shuffle some things around to make room for it to get it to do what you're, or to get this in here, because I think the outflank uh, ability on them is really good. It's just that we don't really have the time to be screwing around with taking the maneuver zone to get them on here. And when you give your opponent something like that to take, they're not taking the combat zone, they're not taking the coin, which the Greyjoys like to try and capitalize on when your opponent takes those two. So I think just having them on the table and making sure you position them in a place where they're going to be getting those flank, uh, those flank shots is going to be really good. It's kind of like the Ironborn Bowmen, when they're not outflanking, kind of dictate your opponent's movement. And as I've said in previous videos, I always enjoy bringing units to an army that start making your opponent have to think before they've even started putting down models. And if they don't think about Ironborn Bowmen when they're deploying and they're just kind of centering in on those Iron Makers and Victarian's unit of Reapers, 
they're going to get their they're going to get caught with their pants down and the ironborn bowmen are going to be shooting them on the side and delivering pillage tokens to make things a lot more dangerous like house harlaw reapers charging in with victarian any one of his tactics cards active on them already with a pillage token is really harsh and with the ironborn bowmen not just getting um you know the chances to actually shake off a, a whole rank with their range shots with the rerolls um also being able to just get that neg one panic test since they're going to be on the pl flank anyways can be really good it's another reason why i think the Greyjoys might want to start putting down some corpse piles to start taking advantage of that depending on if you've got bowmen and reapers but that's kind of a different layer of conversation otherwise they're extremely cheap and can hold objectives that are off on the side and still affect the table when they have that long range shot to round out this list, we're bringing two units of Ironborn Reavers. Now, these are probably the only true glass cannon thing in the faction. They are nasty on the charge. They they move five just like everything else in this list, so they're not super fast but not super slow. Hit on fours, which isn't super great, but they have a 7-6-4 stat, which means they've got some early sustain. And it's they're, Even if your opponent swipes a rank from them, they're still going to be quite dangerous, which is also pretty likely since they have a five-up uh, defense save and then a seven plus morale but they do have sundering so they're going to be swinging heavy damage axes for you know a, a whopping five points a unit and uh for their pillage mechanic they can they get plus one to hit for each one they happen to have so uh sometimes you can do like fun things to set this unit up if you're if you your ironborn uh, bowmen aren't really in a good spot you can just take some pot shots at something to try and lower their ranks so that the ironborn reavers get a better chance of getting that pillage token early on while they're hitting on fours re-rolling and then they should after the iron bowmen go in be able to shift that or shave that rank off right away and start being able to hit a little bit better so that when they start attacking again after they've taken some damage it's not so difficult for them to do what they want to do I think for five points, these guys are really great, and we've already got some pretty decent sustain between the Reapers and the Iron Makers, to where having these guys kind of come in and be either do things on their own and go after targets that the other guys don't want to go into or softening, up, softening them up for when they do arrive to start fighting, uh, I think that they're perfectly fine, and they're just they're a phenomenal five-point unit, and when they talk about the lethality in the game kind of going down in 1.7 unless the Greyjoys change which I don't think is going to happen uh, I think these guys really do exemplify uh, lethality in A Song of Ice and Fire in 1.7 so the NCU suite for this list is one that I definitely struggled with quite a bit there's a lot of different ways you can kind of point this list because it's the Greyjoys are just so variable and since you focus uh Victorian in a very specific direction of fighting and sustaining uh you you have plenty of options there you're not short of them so i don't my, my ncu setup is probably not the most efficient but i think it's definitely bringing the tools that i want to bring although this first one might be a little bit wishy-washy we're putting in wendemir maester of the Greyjoy house or House Greyjoy. Uh, so he has the ability Raven Tending. He begins the game with one order token, and at the start of a friendly turn, you can remove one order token from Windermere. And if you do, you choose one of the following abilities. You either draw one tactics card and restore two wounds to one friendly combat unit, or one friendly combat unit performs a three-inch shift. Now, when Windermere uh, claims a zone, you may replace that zone's effect with put an order token on Windermere. So he can he has two really cool abilities. Now it takes him a while to build those up because we don't really have a way to get extra order tokens on our NCUs, but Greyjoys are pretty much fine just farting around on the tactics board anyways. If we've got some really harsh cards in our hand that kind of want make us want to have our opponent take the combat zone from us so we can get some cool abilities from it or taking that coin uh, or the wealth or whatever you want to call it, um, then we can just kind of put him on another one that we don't really care about, block a block a, uh, a tactic zone from our opponent to make sure they aren't getting a lot of their benefits and then we can just get that order token back on him to get those other really cool abilities where we can draw that extra card and restore some wounds or get a little bit uh, more threat extension on our charges 
And with Windermere being able to use those tokens at the start of a friendly turn instead of when he needs to claim them, it's just a nice way to make sure that you're getting the most use out of him. Like, I, I could see an NCU like this just saying, like, you have to do it. You have to spend the order token when you claim the zone, and then that would be really bad. But for being able to, to just get that right away and then still get the benefit of that ability within the same round is a really big benefit that I think make, makes Wendemir a really great choice for a Greyjoy army, specifically this one since our tactics cards are always rough and nasty for our opponent, and just being able to heal some wounds back up on our stuff makes it really difficult for our opponent to kind of chew through what it is we're presenting to them. Windermere could probably go in for Dampair if that's kind of the way you wanted to go with it, but I really do like him here. So uh, speaking, of, I'm not speaking of Dampair, so you know that he's not in here at least. So we've got Roderick Harlaw as the second NCU, and this is the final one. So I definitely wanted to be more present on the table than present on the tactics board. I think with the shift to where we're getting a lot of, we're getting no more three-point NCUs, I think two, uh, two NCUs on the tactics board, unless you're really pointed at controlling or doing specific things, is kind of the way to go if you're a more combat-focused army. So Roderick Harlaw has the ability Scholar Among Raiders, where he begins the game with two order tokens, and then at the start of any turn, you can remove one order token from Roderick, and if you do, you place any number of tactics cards from your hand to the side, then draw one plus that many cards, and then shuffle the cards you set aside back into your tactics deck. So the thing about this list, or Greyjoys in particular, is they're not, they don't quite have the same problem like Baratheons do, where like, there are just a lot of cards in your hand that could be dead, and this is 1.6 Baratheons. I don't know how the 1.7 ones are going to shake out, because I don't pay too much attention to the spoilers, because I'd just rather it all be in my hands at once, instead of having to, you know, figure it out, like, along the way. But, um, for Greyjoys, there are definitely points in this list where there, you'll just have some cards that are duds, depending on who you're playing against or where you're at in the game. So having two chances during the game to not just draw an extra card, but to just kind of reset your deck. The, the fantastic thing about Roderick is that you don't have to do something like put those cards on the bottom of your deck or put them back into your deck in any way before you start drawing your new ones. You just get to say, for this draw, these cards don't exist, and I get to pull cards off the top of my deck. And then once you're done, you can pepper them back in, and then maybe when you need them, you'll be able to see them a little bit quicker. Uh, but for the most part, you're just kind of recycling your hand into making sure that you're getting something a little bit more useful at the time. And I really do appreciate that about Roderick Harlaw, and it makes sure that um, that uh, Victorian can kind of keep up the tempo. And that's kind of what this list is almost getting at. I think I might have talked about it in the last Greyjoy video that I made, but I feel like the Greyjoys really have this idea of tempo down, where they're always kind of controlling the pace of the game through either extra actions or making sure that they're doing the damage they need to do in the way they need to do it or surviving when they need to. They're a very versatile and... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're flexible, right? So they are used to adversity and can kind of adapt to it quite quickly. I think that uh, Roderick ends up really bringing that to this list, and then everything else we've kind of peppered in here really plays into that idea of making sure that we're starting the game on our terms, we're getting the charges we want to with Rush of Aggression, we're making sure that we get to do a lot of damage with sustained assault. So and we can also get all our extra charges from... overrun G's and uh, and assault orders. So I think that this list in general is just going to be a really fun one to play. And as you put this on the table, if this is what you wanted to try out with Victorian, you can at least kind of get a feel for what he's doing and how the Greyjoys work around him. It's not that he really works around the Greyjoys. It's that the Greyjoys bend their tactics around what he's bringing to the table anyways. So you can kind of, you know, play it out and figure out how you want to go from there. But for right now, this seems like a good list to me. And it has a thick uh, set of activations. I mean, we're looking at... Uh, at least six on the table activations with two NCUs. So we're activation heavy, in my opinion. Not by like free folk standards or anything like that, but um, you know, this seems like it's pretty good considering a lot of other lists aren't going to have access 
outside of free folk to like four point units that they're just going to be able to pepper in and still be able to bring these heavy hitters like iron makers and reef or reapers and then reavers on top of that and still be able to have a wide enough list to cover the table so let me know what you think about this one and if you're getting into gray joys uh what's your most excited to play in the comment section below otherwise i'm really looking forward to getting more a song of ice and fire content back out there i've been missing the game dearly and with 1.7 getting closer and closer and closer to being a reality and with the way that vaccinations are kind of playing out here and seeing some of the other ice and fire players wanting to get in games i think it's only a matter of time before i start putting uh some ice and fire models back on the table